All right, this week's episode of Hunt Suburbia is with Steve Champa. He is an awesome dude. Uh, he's a guy who's been taking leaps in his hunting career, a guy that's gone from shooting anything that walks, which, uh, again, no problem if you do that. That's fun. Uh, but shooting anything that walks to uh, only wanting to shoot mature deer, and over the last couple seasons he's taken five mature deer since he's made a conscious effort to make that switch. Um, so he's, uh, he's, he's learned a lot in the last five years. The woods have started to – you know, come together for him. He's starting to see things better. So we dive into a lot of that um, and uh, what it what it means to take a leap and how you kind of get there. Uh, tell some stories from the past uh, season, the past couple seasons. He's brought a couple bucks with him uh, that we display here as well. Um, and before we get into that, though, uh, touching base again quickly on hunt stock. Hunt stock is eight weeks away now, uh, sneaking up on us here. Um, we still have. Plenty of space in the festival area. If you are a local business or brand that relates to the hunting world um, or outdoors, uh, the outdoors world, and you want to have a space there, hit me up, huntsuburbia at gmail.com. If you are a content creator, you got a podcast. If you're starting a podcast or you, you want to launch your podcast at Huntstock, hit me up, man. You, you, we'll, we'll get you guys a space there. And uh, we want uh, anybody who is advancing the world of uh, the outdoor content creation world and hunting content creation. We want you to be a part of this. Um, Huntstock is a big networking event. We're all going to get together, <clears throat> meet each other, hang out, have fun, tell stories. Um, and we're going to have a kick-ass festival in the background happening with uh, the sponsors, exhibitors, and um, 3D archery course, which, again, will be 20 targets. be 25 bucks to shoot the 3D archery course. We're going to be benefiting givetothose.org with a portion of the proceeds from that and uh, also with the uh, sponsorship of targets. We have sold 12 targets, uh, 100 bucks each, um, to have a sign at the target. All of that money goes directly to givetothose.org. If you want to scoop up some of those other targets, we have eight left. Um, let's do it. That'll be a quick two grand going to, to give to those. Um, so, again, hit me up, DM me, or send me an email, huntsuburbia at gmail.com. Um, uh, we've got we're, we're filling out more and more seminars uh, guys are hitting me up um, you know guys with a lot of knowledge to share unfortunately we've pretty much filled up the uh, the main stage seminar schedule we're gonna have a second stage uh, at Huntstock that'll be outdoors the main stage is indoors second one will be outdoors um, it'll be kind of shouting distance only we're, we're not gonna have audio for that one but um, still I mean you, you're gonna be able to hear uh, you know, a good amount of people are going to be able to hear from that outside stage. So we're filling up that one and we may even have a third stage. A couple sponsors are talking to me about wanting to build their own and have it next to, to their, uh, activation there. So there's going to be plenty going on at hunt stock, sneak away, shoot the course when you want to make sure you're there for the seminars that you want. Um, we will release the seminar schedule. I would guess, uh, four weeks out. So in another month, We'll have the seminar schedule locked in stone and uh, and released to the public so you can see what's going on Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The guarantees, uh, Big Woods Bucks is doing their podcast every day, Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. Um, Hunt Suburbia, I'll be doing a uh, podcast uh, Friday and Saturday, but not Sunday. Um, I am hopefully going to be doing uh, some live Living Legends series, so with some great guests on Friday and Saturday. Um, <clears throat> Hal is going to be giving a seminar each day and you've got tremendous amount of big woods bucks team members, um, just hunt club team members, uh, Northwoods whitetails. You've got a, a bunch of groups that are going to be doing seminars each day as well. Joe Judd doing Turkey calling seminar. We've got mass wildlife's going to be doing something Backcountry hunters and anglers doing a seminar. Um, we, uh, just, I just got hit up by, um, uh, there's going to be a lot of big, uh, saddle contingency there. We've got that saddle section of the festival all marked out a couple different saddle brands come in. Um, some guys, uh, New York saddle hunters who kind of, um, developed that SRT DRT climbing method, uh, just hit me up. They're going to be a late add to the festival. They're coming and will, um, uh, do some classes on, on their unique climbing method, which is cool. That'll be over in the saddle area. Um, uh, a couple of guys from New Hampshire, some really good hunters. Uh, I think you guys will be excited to see our, our late ad. They just hit me up this week as well. Um, but yeah, anybody wants to come, you got a content, 
uh, creation page, you got a podcast, you're going to start one, let me know. You can be a part of it. We're still looking for volunteers as well. Um, but we're getting down to the wire here. So uh, hit me up, huntsuburbia gmail.com. And uh, I'm really looking forward to it, guys. So let's get into this podcast, though, right now with Stephen Champa. All right, another episode of Hunt Suburbia Podcast, sitting here with Steve Champa. We were just talking, and he was telling a story. Sometimes this happens pre-podcast, you get into a good story. I just want to jump back into it uh, and get it recorded so we don't miss it. Yeah, absolutely. Um, so, you were saying... Yeah, so, <laughs> going back to uh, 2020 deer season, yeah. I um, I went out and I, was, I went to go scout this area, and of course, m- my good buddy Neil Pendleton had already explored it at one point in time, and... He, you know, he gave me some really good intel on the, the piece of property that I was so going. That's the bad part about living where Neil lives. Yeah, anywhere I go, he's already been, <laughs> or, he, or he knows about it. So, but it's good. He's a, he, you know, he always, he's pretty open with all the intel. That, yeah. You know, he's he's found over the years, and, you know, he told me the, you know, some of the right places to be in in the spot, and, you know, told me where there's a pretty good scrape to put a camera on, and, so. I hung cameras in July, yeah, in July in the spot, and about three weeks after I hung the cameras, I got pictures of a, of an eight pointer, this nine pointer, and then that five pointer that's on the ground over there, and um, I hunted it once in October because the, uh, yeah, it was either late September or early October, the um, the bucks were coming, they were like. Two or three minutes after the end of legal light, it was yeah. it, they they were they were starting to check the, the scrapes out a little more and ch- checking on the doe groups and I um I, I stayed out until I got like a, a a you know a dusk picture and then I finally slipped in there the next night it was a cold front coming in so I was like this is perfect I went out there I think I saw I think I saw two bucks that night small seven pointer and a four pointer I passed on them both I had them both at like twelve yards fast forward a month into November. Um, it was November 5th or 6th. I got a picture at like 8 o'clock at night in New Hampshire. You know, you can't hunt the same calendar day as a cell camera. So I was like, oh, well, I'm good to hunt this tomorrow morning. So I, I got the picture. I think it was the 5th. And then uh, the a next nice one, eight-pointer. Yeah, it was that, ni- that nice eight-pointer. And it was a doe. She, you know, she was coming pa- across my camera looking back on her backtrack. And, oh, you know, the next picture was that eight-pointer behind her. You know, within a, it, it was like 8.04 and then 8.05 the buck was behind her. So I went in there that next morning, first light, a four-pointer came walking, or it was a four- or six-pointer. He came by, I, I passed on him, and then uh, a doe come, you know, flying out of the swamp, and I was like, all right, some, you know, I could hear all the commotion. I'm like, something's, something's going on here. <laughs> so I, I shouldered my muzzle loader, and I'm sitting there, and here he comes out of the swamp, and he's not running, but he's on a, you know, trot, and so I'm, I'm picking my gaps in between pine trees and oaks, and I finally, yep, that's the opening. As soon as the front of his chest at that opening, I fired, and he uh, he took off, and he looked like he was hit because his tail was down, and he stayed right behind that doe, and, and they both took off. And um, I got down there, and I found white hair everywhere. Never found any blood, never, con- you know, just the hair. So I think I grazed him. I had a dog come out, and uh, we searched for, like, six, eight hours, and we never even found a drop of blood, and, hmm. you know. But he the, was on scent the whole time? or he Yeah, the, the, the dog brought us to the edge of, of a swamp, and there was, you know, and once we got there, it kind of went four or five different directions, and we kept going back to the, you know, where the potential hit site was. And yeah. We never made anything of it, and I was like, man, we just, we really ruined this place for the rut now, you know. We <laughs> we, we were out there for six or eight hours, carefree, you know, t- ton of ground scent everywhere. And yep. I was like, well, that's the end of the end of this. So... That was, I want to say it was like a Wednesday or Thursday during muzzle order season. I t- usually take those first two weeks of November off. And yep. I think it was like the the 12th or something like that. I got a picture of this buck. Um, same, same, same camera. Same camera night before. <laughs> um, and I was like, all right, time to go in there tomorrow morning. So I went in there the following morning. And uh, I had right at daybreak, I had a six-pointer come out uh, out of a swamp. He came out at like 60 yards. And then... I was at right at daybreak, and then at like seven o'clock, I had another six point, different six pointer come by at like ten yards, and then uh, I was texting my uncle. We were supposed to go to Maine that night or that afternoon to go to my camp, and I'm like, yeah, I'm gonna sit till like eight thirty, nine o'clock, and then I'll come pick you up and we'll head up to Maine. And I'm just, as soon as I got done hitting send on that text, I look up and here comes this buck, he, you know, right in that pose. He come out of the swamp and he he's looking, you know, just looking around out into the the hardwoods, and it was like a forty five yard shot, and I. I shot him right there. You can still kind of see where I hit him. Oh, but, yeah. Um, Taxidermist did good work covering it. Though. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, and he was quartering, you know, quartering to me, and he just he he piled up right there. You were in a stand. Yeah, I was in yeah. my climber. <clears throat> um, he looks like a big deer. What did he weigh? He was he was one fifty five, I think. He mm-hmm. he was you know pretty pretty good deer. He was three yeah. and a half year old. They sent his teeth out. I thought he was gonna be four and a half, but he was three and a half. Yep. Good good deer for three and a half. Oh yeah. You know if he was if he made it a four and a half, five and a half, he would have been something real special. Yep. But I wasn't great genetics. Yeah, I wasn't passing on that deer in, in <laughs> you know southern New Hampshire. Um, so I got it. Told my uncle I was like, hey, we're gonna be a little late going to Maine. <laughs> So I it was a we got a big buck to drag. Yeah, yeah, so I was by myself and I hurt my elbow like the day before and I told uh Kevin Plan I was like, "Hey, if I shoot one, I'm going to need your help." And uh my adrenaline was going all the endorphins in my body. I pulled that deer right out. I was I was like, "Hey, can you pick me up?" He's like, "Yeah, no problem." So he picked me up. <laughs> And, uh, yeah, it's happened to me a couple of times too. We're just like, hey, can you come help? And then by the time they're there, it's already dragged. It's already out. out. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Th- that happened with Jim. Helped me a couple of times this year. He's like, you need help? Yeah, sure, I'll take help. By the time he gets there, I'm 100 yards from the truck, and <laughs> pretty much, you know, slap each other, high five, and good job, pat on the back. But um, yeah, so that was that was him. And so I went up to my camp in Maine, and of course, I'm up in Maine deer hunting, and my cell cameras here are still sending sending me pictures of that eight pointer I had missed, and that five pointer and you know every afternoon every morning every afternoon every morning and that same camera yeah there was two or three cameras in that spot and you know between the three of them i was like oh yeah. my god why am i doing up here what am i doing up here and so finally again on sundays in maine saturday night i'm like time to head home i did a <laughs> i did a podcast podcast with uh, the live free and hunt guys on my way home and yeah. i'm like i'm like i'm gonna kill this buck in the morning and they're like you sure i'm like i'm positive i'm like i'm i'm gonna kill him in the morning and uh sure enough it was like 6 30 the the, the swamp that was there, it had a, like a thin crust of ice on it, and you could just and then you, it'd stop. And I'm like, man, that almost sounds like a person walking through the swamp, just still hunting. And then yeah, Neil. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then I could see the, you know, I could see the, the the silhouette of a deer, and I could see how wide he was, and he was the widest deer out there by far. He's like 23 on the inside, and um, he came walking straight at me, and there was a big hemlock right in front of me, and um. My gun tag was already filled, so I was using my crossbow because you can use a crossbow in southern New Hampshire. Um, so I was, I was sitting there and I, I had my phone in my hand and I just put it on my lap. And I was like, there's kind of, I kind of had to like lean around the tree. And I was in my, my I was in my, uh, my climber. So I'm like, I'm gonna stand up and just kind of swing around the tree and shoot. And when I stood up, I forgot my phone was in my lap and he was mid step. <laughs> when my, when my phone fell and I was like, oh my god, hey, keep talking, we'll, we'll bring him up. Yeah, and um. My phone hit the ground and he kind of he locked up for a second. Didn't really phase him too much, and then he uh, he kept walking. And he he got right into the to the uh, the shooting lane. I shot him at twenty four yards. People can see those those two were four days apart. Yeah, right? four days apart. He was a Wednesday and he was a Sunday, so it was uh it's pretty. What a beautiful five. Yeah, he's a cool deer. He, I think he, yeah, I think he's twenty three inside. He's he's cool cool deer. Just not a lot of character. Or, a lot of character, but not a lot, you know. Not yep. a lot of times, but a lot of character. Do you want to hang him up? I don't think he'll hang on that. Okay. Yeah, um, because he's got that weird. He's got, yeah, he's got that that wall pedestal bracket on him. But yeah, that was that was twenty twenty. That was an awesome year. And then I got pictures after the season of that eight pointer that I had missed. So I knew he had made it. And uh, I yeah, I was gonna ask about that. Are yeah. Still, are you still on him? So I shot him this year and never found him. Really? Yeah, yeah. The same night Dave Lynch from killed his deer. Me and Dave were texting. Dave's like, I just shot one. I was like, I just shot one too. And uh, and he's like, Did you get yours? And I was like, I don't know. I, I was like, I definitely hit him. And Dave's like, Oh, I got mine. So what's the story on that? So was it same kind of same spot? Yes, it's same exact tree. I was in the yep. same tree. It's just you know when it's one of those things when they're when they're in that part of the swamp they're you know they're it's they're forced to to come through it's a, like a natural funnel that they have to come you yeah. know by where i am and um i was getting pictures like on and off a couple of days before of you know of some smaller bucks like a four pointer and a small six and then i got a, a nighttime picture of them at like midnight and i was like well they're they're in there checking the does or eating acorns whatever they were doing it was mid-october and uh, we had a cold front coming that night. And it was like, everybody shot deer that night. It was one of those nights where everyone's like, buddy arrow, yeah. buddy arrow, buddy arrow. Yeah. So I was like, that's going to be the night to kill. So I went in there that night, and it was, you know, probably the last 10 minutes of legal light I can hear behind me. I can hear him coming, hear him coming. And I can just see his left side, and I'm like, oh, yeah, that's a shooter. And he came out, and he was, I thought he was like 
thought he was 40 yards, but he was actually 30. I just – that gray light really messed with me. You know, yeah. I, I – I, 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 did myself a disservice by not rain finding him. I, I just was like, oh, that's thir- or that's forty, and he was really thirty. And I think I skipped it, like right. I think I skipped it right off here. He was quartering to me. I think I skipped it right off. So you don't back. think it was a fatal shot? No, then? I don't think. I don't think so. Oh, good. I, and so, I had a I had a dog tracker come out just to confirm. You know, I'd rather I'd rather be safe than sorry in that situation. Especially you have that tool to use in New Hampshire. You yep. know, you might as well. And Adam Evans came out, and we looked for same thing. We looked that night. We jumped. We jumped the deer. Um, but he just he kept going. He never stopped. So we went back out there the next day, and we we went downwind of the swamp, and we we checked every which way, and you know both pieces of hardwoods we checked with the dog, you know downwind, and we we never found or, or found the the buck, and I never got another picture of him, and but maybe this year. This year, yeah. Do you, this year. Is the camera still there? You get oh, yeah, go yeah, You just leave it there. Yeah, I leave yeah. I leave cameras there year round. So yeah. I just gotta get out there and put some batteries in the cameras. Yeah, but, yeah, that was. Well, good. You're going to be happy as soon as you see the first picture oh, yeah, of him. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully he made it. I'm pretty sure he did because, I mean, we would have found a wound bed or something, and he just never stopped. So, like I said, I think I just skipped it off his back because I, you know, I, was ten, I, I overestimated him being 10 yards closer than what mm-hmm. he was. So, but, well, well, a couple of important themes that you talked about there I think people should take note on, um, if you aren't already, is, is cold fronts. you got to hunt. When you have a good cold front coming in, you hunt. and especially earlier, earlier in the season, where it might be that first really good one, you got to be out there hunting, right? Yep. You got to do whatever you can to Almost take that definitely. off. Yeah, those those days are those are what <clears throat> whitetail hunters dream about. You can't yeah. you can't pass those up. Yeah, I, if the one if one of those are coming on and and my wife says we have plans, honey, we don't have plans. I, I won't be there. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm going on. Yeah. but she's she's wicked cool about that. So yeah. Luckily, it's worked. It's just when those big bucks start moving. Yeah, exactly. You know? It gets them on their feet. It gets everything on their feet. I mean, those cold front days, you'll be sitting in a stand, and you'll just get set up, and here comes deer feeding by yeah. you. You know, it's, it happens more times. Don't you think not. it's also they're like they're moving because it's cold, but they're also kind of it's just like they're remembering, oh shit, the rut's gonna come yeah, soon. Yeah, the know? rut's coming. I, winter's coming. <laughs> I gotta get. I gotta. You know, I gotta eat some acorns and put yeah. some put some weight on. And, and I mean, both these deer. I think he was like November thirteenth, and he was the seventeenth or something, but. He had no fat, and he was loaded with fat. It was it was like he'd been chasing for a month, and he yeah he, he was just just getting into it. They're you know? so they're so different. Yeah. It's weird. And they were same same tree, yeah. you know. But and that's what Lanny Benoit says too. You know, he shot shot a deer that was really short, but was two hundred and seventy four pounds, yeah. and another one that just barely weighed two hundred that was much longer, right? But had no fat, but that short one had fat all the way up in his ears, right? <laughs> yeah, it's, it's crazy how that works. Yeah. It really is. Must be a different food source. Maybe it's genetics too. Yeah, it know? definitely could be. Because I mean, I don't, I don't think these. I mean, they're definitely from the same area, but I think they're different parents. Because yeah, they look di- completely they, different. Yeah, they're two completely different deer. Yeah, even their shade of their yeah, their, the, hide. their hide. He's very light. He's very dark. Yeah, you know, he's got he's got dark rack. He's his is lighter. Light. Yep. wide, less points. Yeah, yeah, they're they're two completely different. That, that poor deer, he he had buckshot in his neck, he had an arrow in his shoulder, and he had plastic from a car in his right rear quarter. Oh my god! Yeah, uh, when, when and so like one of his shoulders, you know, was full size, and the other side looked like the guy from Scary Movie. It was it was, <laughs> it was all you know small the, the and stir hand. Yeah, yeah, it was it was, it was, it was, it was it, and it, he looked fine when I shot him. And and it's funny if you, when I go back and look at pictures, you can see the difference. But when I when we skinned him out, he was you could clearly see it. It was drastically different. And there was an arrow in his shoulder, and um, I'm like, no wonder why his rack is so, you know, poor. He 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 had some trauma at one point in his life or another. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and I think the the shoulder, the arrow was when he was young, because I was really healed over the buckshot, in his neck was, you know, there was maybe a year prior, it might have even been, you know, that a couple days, you know, a couple days before opening day of shotgun or something. But, um, yeah, some of these deer are just freaking crazy warriors. Oh, huh? uh, yeah. The plastic, and then the plastic in his rear quarter, like he got hit like the night before or something like that. It was like, it, it looked like I shot what him. Kind his, of pla- what kind of plant? It was like a legit, like gray plastic from like a car. It was like a, like a, oh, piece, yeah, it was piece like, of fender. It, it, whatever it was, <laughs> yeah. bumper. It was legit. It was, you know, it was like a one inch by one inch piece. And I was like, what is that? And I was like, <laughs> Oh, it's plastic, and they had you know it was black on one side and gray on the other. I was Jeez. like, wow. I was like, yeah, this poor deer, he 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 got in some some trouble, you know. But uh, our haunted there's a haunted toy in there. That oh, just... is there? It just goes off by itself. <laughs> Here I am. That little, that little fucking <laughs> rabbit creeps me out. Yeah. Um, so the and then the other thing obvious that's obvious from that story is you found a killer spot. Yeah, it is. And what's it's, the what's the key to that? It's so it's a wicked highly pressured area all around the surrounding. 
parts and the access is near impossible to get to where I go to. You either have to wear hip boots or chest waders to, and walk through swamp, and that's what I do, or you have to canoe or kayak. And um, a lot of people aren't even going to do that. Yeah. You know, a lot of people will just see something like that, and they'll just stay away from it. But all the pressure around the surrounding area, you know, drives – drives the deer out into the center of this, you know, these hardwoods and the swamp. And it deters a lot of people because yep. it's, it's landlocked by wa- you know, or it's waterlocked. It's, there's no way to get to it without crossing substantial water. Yeah. And, um, so when I, when I was out there opening day, when I shot him, I heard like six shots all within, you know, four or 500 yards of me before he came out. And, you know, I saw three bucks. Yeah, I keep him. forgetting I, that it's your muzzleloader hunting too, not even. Right, yeah. it's muzzleloader, yeah. then, then shotgun. But yep. I didn't hear, I don't think I heard any shot. I didn't hunt it religiously. I, I just hunt it, you know, if you hunt the same tree religiously, you, you know, a lot of times deer pick up on your activity, and yep. your presence being there. Yep. I picked my days cold fronts and I picked, you know. Yeah, you haven't even been in there very many times. No, I, I think I hunted it four times that year, and I and I killed. I could have killed all four times, and yep. I did kill two of the four, and I should have killed shot. three of yeah. the four. Yeah. You know, so it was all about picking my days in there. But it, <clears> once the like I said, I heard I think six shots the morning I sh- I shot him, and I saw three deer that morning. So obviously the deer were you know using that as their their scapegoat to get out of there. And uh, they, do you do you pay attention to the wind to go into that spot too? Yeah, so or luck- is the cold front kind of. Because the cold front will trump it, even no matter what the wind's doing, right? You're yeah. still gonna go in, or yeah, what? it. Uh, you know, the, the when actually when I shot him, it was I wasn't like a long sleeve, like a light long sleeve. It was warm that morning, but um, luckily the way the deer come into that that spot is, you know, in where I access from, it's the shortest distance to where I hunt. Um, as the crow flies, it's still a few hundred yards, you know, four or five hundred yards. But the, the bedding, you know, the main bedding is you know, above where I, I access from. So the deer don't really have a purpose of being over here. There's no yeah. hummocks or dry land or no purpose for them yeah. to be over here, but it's great access for me. And it, you know, your ground sense stays right there in the water. It's, 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 yeah. it's near bulletproof access. You yeah. Know? And I only have, when I get to where I want to be, I only have like a 60 yard walk on dry land. So if they if they don't walk that 60 yard stretch, they have no idea. I'm yeah. They're oblivious to, to my presence, you know? Even on that cold crunch day where you saw the silhouette of him, yeah. you, you know, you, you don't think would... He might have heard me coming through because yeah. I, I had to break ice. You know? But it was just curious. And just, yeah. You know, I, and a lot of times, like... If the wind's good, they don't know. Yeah. If I'm if I'm being noisy, I, you know, I it, 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 I always try my best to replicate it here. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll sit there, if I, take a few steps, grunt, yep. you know, take a few steps, grunt. And do the stomp. Yeah, once in a while. yeah. Replicate a deer as best as you can <laughs> because if if you do something, if you know, if you if you just stay on a steady gait or a steady walk, they're gonna pick up. They're not. Yeah. They're not stupid. They're gonna know you're you're a predator yep. of some sorts, whether you're a human or you know coyote. Well, obviously you're not gonna sound like a coyote, but they, they're gonna know <laughs> you're you're a human or something that's not supposed to be there. But if you take three, four steps, stop, listen, you know, observe, grunt. And I was getting in there really early. I mean. I didn't. I didn't even want to leave my truck there. My wife was dropping me off at four o'clock in the morning. That was another question I was going to ask. Yeah. Is how early? I hear so many times people who are keying in on swamps yeah. and r- remote, like the bee, you know, hunting bee style, yeah. getting getting remote into those swamps. Yeah, the, around pressured pressured areas, you just got to get in there real early. Yeah, I, I'm I'm like people call me crazy, but I'm to the extreme. I don't use a flashlight in the woods. I never. I could have a mile walk in. I don't use a flashlight. Wow. For one, yeah. I don't, I don't want a few people. people I, like that. I don't want people seeing my flashlight. You know, whether it's uh, residents there or whether it's other hunters because if you know if somebody saw my flashlight out there they're gonna be like what's that guy doing out there they hear yeah. a gunshot yeah they're gonna they're gonna figure out real yeah. fast what's going on you know so i usually just you know i let my eyes adjust really good and then i'll i'll venture my way out into where i'm going and take a couple sticks in the eye every once in a yeah, while yeah exactly <laughs> yeah a little battle scars during hunting season my arms are just do you destroyed. wear your glasses in the woods or contacts it, uh no i always wear my glasses i i have a hard time my uncle my always did that yeah. and i was just like man why don't you just wear contact because i would get so pissed if they got fogged uh, up that, well it's happened to me not with deer but with turkeys man it screwed me so many times with turkeys i've been sitting there and you know you're wearing a face mask that's covering your nose and yeah here comes a bird and all of a sudden yeah, yeah. glasses are just gray and i'm like ugh, like trying to rub them real quick <laughs> before a turkey comes in i can't tell you how many times i've been busted by turkeys that you know take off and and uh as my glasses are fogged up but i just have the hardest time touching my eyeball i can get i can take them out no problem but getting them in i blink too much trying to get them (laughs) in but a lot of times i'll like if i'm going through like something that's that thick or that you know high of a stem count i'll just take them off put them in my pocket until i get to where i want to be in the dark but if if it's daylight they're staying on because i need to be able to see yeah that was my biggest that was my biggest downfall for a long time 
you know, I, I, I was like, I don't need glasses. I don't need glasses. And I had one, one year that I wounded, you know, two good bucks and I never found them. And I was like, what is going on here? What is going on? And I, um, I finally, I was like, I'm gonna go to the eye dog. So how many glasses. years ago did you get glasses? Three years ago. Really? That's yeah, it? Yeah. Yeah. Three Holy years shit. ago. Holy shit. So I, I went out, so I always had like, you know, I, I was doing okay, but then, you know, there was, there was times where I, I'd pick my scope up and put the crosshairs right on the deer and I'd touch off and I'd be like, I saw Brown and I was like, I'm almost positive. I was right behind the shoulder and, you know, I'd miss him or I'd, you know, and I'm one of those people. I, I'm, I'm at the range like once a week. I, I, if I miss, I want it to be on me. I don't want it to be on the gun. I don't want to have the gun to blame. I always, you know, I'll go down to the range once a week, take two shots. Yep. Gun's good. Go back in the woods and. You know, just that mental state of mind when you're in the woods, you know your gun's on. Yeah. So I was having the hardest time, you know, with missing, and and uh, and I, I was like, what is going on here? And finally I went and I, I got my eyes checked, and then it was like after that, was, I, do, I didn't miss a beat. Do you, you remember know? what your uh, prescription is? I have stigmatism in both my eyes, so that's like <clears> my <throat> biggest thing. Like anything that's circular looks oval and like very flared, but I I forget what it is. It's Yeah, because just like in high school, uh, I I went and got my eyes checked. I I didn't think I was gonna need them need anything either. Yeah. But I think it was freshman or sophomore year or yeah. junior. I don't actually don't remember, but I remember it being like once I finally put contacts in, I was like, "Holy shit! I've been missing all of this." Yeah, I can see all and these fine details. Especially, I was thinking like, "I've been I could see that girl all the way down the hallway." <laughs> oh my god! I don't even know who that was. Before. I was like, "Damn!" Yeah. I don't, now I can now I can check out all these chicks. Yeah. And it was like just night and day. It it's, was it's like, a game changer, and I, I I kicked myself in the ass for not doing it years before. Yeah, like I wonder how many years like that that maybe you missed. Uh, or how many deer, fine details? Or how many deer, deer I walked by because I couldn't see them? You yeah. know, it was everything. It was a was a heavy not a blur but it was a fuzz it was very hard to see clear and now you know since i've gotten glasses i can be walking through the woods and i'll see a deer flicker its tail i know you know i can stop on a dime and oh there's a deer you know yeah four years ago that would have never happened i would have been i would have blown right by that deer and the deer would have seen me way before (laughs) i saw it so i'm always worried about a couple things with glasses in the woods is one for some reason it's probably just my mental uh, mental issue i'm looking through a piece of glass i feel like everything's kind of fake like yeah. this i don't feel like it's i just feel like i'm looking through my eyes right. right but if i'm looking through my glasses it feels something's weird about it i don't know it's just like this this, this it's hard with peripherals too and We're, peripherals yeah your peripherals are are terrible with glasses you know how many times you know and i can't, I can't trust how-, how far something is i just yeah. i'm like is it I have that problem too. I, I, you know, a lot of times, like when I get in a tree, if I'm bow hunting, I'll, I'll, I'll range find everything that's like that's a potential shooting lane, that's a potential yeah. shooting lane, and I'll, I'll, you know, take a mental note. That's 24 yards. That's 30 yards. That's 36 yards. So I don't have the doubt as much, but I can't tell you how many times I've been clipped on or you know drawn on a deer, and all of a sudden here comes another deer out of my peripherals, and I can't tell. Oh, yeah. I can't tell yeah. what it is. I'm like. Oh, so, fuck. so I'll you know I'll be I'll be I'll be you know anchored right in about to let my shot break and I'm like oh what is that no I'll have to you know yep yeah yep. okay it's just a skipper <laughs> you know <laughs> I didn't even think about that yeah it, it's happened so many times it happened to me probably twice this year and I wonder if uh, like I would just think that deer could see the glare or a shine from the frame or something and yeah it's probably not that big of a deal you're doing you're doing just fine by the, by the time that's the kind of shit that freaks me out yeah by the time they see it like. I say the same thing about wearing gloves when turkey hunting, and it, it's it's bit me in the ass. But <laughs> if a turkey can see my hands, they should be dead by that point, you know. Yeah, yeah. And or and I feel the same way with deer. By the time they see my glasses, they should, you know, if I'm going to shoot them, they should be dead. But yeah, I, yeah. there's been deer that have passed on, and they've been, you know, five yards away, and they, <laughs> or, you know, or on the ground, they're looking yeah. at you, trying to pick you out, get you to move. But that's it, luckily I did it. It was the best thing I ever did was get glasses because I can see substantially better the second best thing you'll ever do is get lasik or contacts well that's what i want to do i want to do lasik but it's so damn expensive yeah it's, i don't know how i feel about my eyeball game. that or a bear mount yeah yeah <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't know how i feel about my you know my eyes getting cut open but i i think i could get past it for a good vision i hear yeah. a lot of people have problems with gray light with with uh, yeah i don't know LASIK. about lasik yeah I, a buddy of mine says like right at first and last light he has a hard time with like he says very you know blurry and I, that's when it's that most crucial when yeah you're in the woods you know yeah. that's the most crucial time when you have to see is and have the best vision so that totally i would i feel like i'd be better with contacts versus lasik yeah but maybe one day yeah we'll see um let's talk about your transition so we looked at those two bucks that of mine those are my transition bucks from yeah. like 
that was the first year I started passing blocks, and I think I passed like 20 or 25 before I shot that nine pointer there. Yeah. And you have some more story with like once you, because you've killed a lot of deer and yeah. everything that came by is down. Yeah, oh yeah. You're a killer. Yeah, oh yeah. That, and then there's a lot of that. And then what, <laughs> what, what kind of change and, and how, how and why did it change? Man, so probably from, I didn't really start deer hunting until I was like 17. Like, I went, like, a few times with my dad here and there. My dad wasn't much of a deer hunter. It was, like, a weekend warrior thing. But when I, well, as soon as I got my driver's license and I could go, I was off. I was it was I was sick for it. You know, I'm going hunting. And um, I went from, like you said, I shot everything that came by. It didn't matter if it was a skipper or a spike horn. It, I, I just, I like shooting deer. Yep. And um, I went probably, probably seven years, eight years with that mentality of, you know, shooting a lot of deer and having fun with it you know a spike horn it didn't matter if it was a four pointer six pointer or a skipper they all excited me and they you know they all made me happy yeah but it got probably when i was yeah like when i was 24 25 something like that i i got to the point where i I think i shot a spike yeah i shot a spike horn and it was like the first week of november and i was like i walked up to him i was like why did i do that you know (laughs) and i i i don't I am I'm, I'm a huge believer in shoot what makes you happy. Yeah. But that didn't make me happy. Yeah. All and of I, a sudden. Yeah. It was like a, a you know flip of a switch, and I was like, that didn't make me happy. Why did I do that? You know, I, I you know, you have a little patience. You know, it's the best time. We're coming into the best time of year, and why are you? Why did I do that? You yeah. know. So, from that moment going forward, I, you know, I I was like, you know what, next year I'm turning a new leaf, and I did, and I I think this. So it was the year before I shot these bucks. I think I passed on it. It was like 21 or 22 bucks from September 15th to November 6th is when I killed like the like a good buck that I held out for, you know. I, I passed on a ton of deer during bow season. I passed on a couple bucks during And they were all season. basically yearlings? Yeah, yearlings are two and a half year olds, yep. you know, spikes, four, even basket six pointers. And, um, you know, I shot like a 105, 110 inch eight pointer. And that was like... That was it. When I got that feeling, when I shot that deer, the I step like, up. Yeah, yeah. Yep. I was like, I need that. That was the feeling I first got when I started shooting, you know, does and spike horns and skippers. And yep. when I shot everything that came by, and I yep. got that excitement. That's what I got when I shot that, you know, hundred and ten yeah. inch eight point. Came back. Yeah, it came back, and I was like, this is what I need to achieve. This is, you know, this is what's going to fulfill me as a hunter. And um, the next year, I, same thing. I probably passed on twenty or twenty five bucks, and phew, there was a lot of. I passed. There was so many times. You know, even the year before, I probably would have shot some of the bucks that I, I had passed on. But th- this year was when I was, I really, you know, I, I, I stayed really patient. And one of my biggest problems when I was younger too is I used to, I used to like always try to thread the needle. I'm like, oh, I can make that shot happen yeah. between those two trees, and I'd shoot, and I would, the v. yeah, and yeah. I, I'd either hit the tree or, you know, I'd, I'd make a poor shot on the deer, and I, you know, the last like two or three years, I've really settled down, and I really try to like take my, you know. I'm not going to shoot at a deer when I have a 10 by 10 window. Yeah. I, when I have a wide open shot four yards in front of them, just let them get to that, you know. Yeah. And it's hard. It's hard for any hunter. You're you know? talking 10 inch by 10 Yeah, 10 inch, inch by 10 okay. inch window. Yeah, not, sure not, it's 10, not 10, 10 feet by 10, 10. feet. No, no, no. <laughs> but if, you know, if just be patient, you know. And, and it's hard. You know, I didn't, you know, I, w- I didn't it's grow up. It's hard at first, dude. I but. didn't grow up in a hunting family. So I, you know, this is like 90% of what, I, not 90%, but probably 70% of what I've learned has been, you know, self-taught. Just my woodsmanship, you know. Yep. And um, it, it, it was one of those things that like it took a long time. I, I don't know why. I was like smacking myself in the back of the head. Just wait, you know. It's And it was one of those things that took me a long time to learn to just be patient. And it, it it's paid off. It's, you know, over the last two, three years, it's just, you know. Proof is in the pudding. I've, yeah. I've, I've put five good bucks down in yep. the last three years. So And, dude, there's so many benefits to, like, passing the pa- – first of all, you, you get the chance at better bucks, but isn't it just fun? Yeah, to it see, is. To see – you saw 22 bucks before you let an arrow go. Right, exactly. You know, you know what it, I mean? It, it was awesome. It was – it was learn their behavior and – And, you, you like you said, you learn their behavior, and you learn so much just by observing them, you know? It, it's unbelievable. You'll have a doe and a fawn come walking by or just a single doe, and, you know, she'll just walk along and feed on acorns and she'll go right by, and you'll see a, you know, two-and-a-half-year-old buck come by, and he acts completely different. You know, he's, he's always checking the wind. He's – and it's, he's only a two and a half year old deer mm-hmm. and he's, you know, he's a lot more methodical and how he moves with a purpose. And, and you would have been thinking of just killing him right the year before, year before. and not even picked up on any of the shit that you learned. Right. There were so many times I had deer come <clears throat> walking by and, and I wouldn't even take my bow off the hanger, you know? Was, yep. And there were, you know, it's, it, it's good to that point now when I'm in the woods 
and I see a deer, it's not, you know, if I see him coming from 100 yards away and it's, you know, pretty open woods, I can I can look and I don't even touch my bow or yeah. it's, oh, grab my bow. You yeah. know, I, I got I to gotta get ready because, you know, something something good's coming through and or my gun, whatever it may be. And it, it there's not there's not that hesitation anymore. Before, I'd be like, oh, what is this, a spike, four-point or six-pointer? And now it's it's a shooter or it's not. There's yeah. no in-between. So I always, I always try to use, like, the ears as a judgment. If it's beyond the ears, I'm going to shoot it, <laughs> yeah. you know? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's my kind of my rule of thumb now. I'll, I'd shoot a buck like this in New England every year for the rest of my life. Oh yeah, happy. me too. Yeah, yep. there's you know any, any of these bucks, I would yep. you know they're they're all great deer. Yep. It, it, there's not too many people that would come to New England and pass on, you know, deer of this caliber. It's, yeah, it, I'm trying to pass on the ones above those two. Those are my step ups. Yeah. Step ups, like I, I'm gonna pass on them. I think for a while. Yeah. And, if, and if things dry up. <laughs> yeah. Then you go back to that. Yeah. yeah. Those three and a half year olds, four and a half year olds are in trouble. Yep. Yeah. They're, but those are still oh, they're know, all, yeah they're, they're still great deer and yep. and like you said they're you know they're progression deer they get you to become a better hunter you know that that I, w- I wish I brought that other deer with me that 110 inch eight pointer that that deer changed a lot for me you know that was that was my turning point that really was like I, this is what I want to do I, I want to shoot big deer yeah and and it's been it's been a fun ride the last three years it's been it's been a lot of fun yeah it seems did did you become more have you become more obsessed with hunting yes. since then too? Oh, yeah. My, yeah, so your your scouting and everything oh, yeah. is is increased. My trail a lot more. camera bill every month yeah. has drastically increased. Um, you know, and th- there's a lot of good people that you know have like that helped me get there too. It wasn't like it was just like you know there was a lot of good you know influences that were like it always is, dude. You yeah. can't do it yourself. No, you, you, you can you can, but it's, yeah. yeah. Like, like Neil, for instance, Neil, Neil yep. was like, when I, when I would pass on deer, Neil would be like, I am so proud of you. Good job. You know? And I'd be like, thanks. Man. Like, <laughs> yeah. It was good to have that pick me up because before yeah. I would have been thrilled to shooting that deer. And you know, uh, that, that praise of, you know, of becoming a better hunter was, was just as good as shooting the deer, you yep. know? And, uh, it was good to have people like that in, in my corner, just really cheering me on. And the last, you know, two, three years, I've tried to become that person with other people as well. Yep. If, you know, if somebody's trying to step their game up, I, I try to be right in their corner for them, supporting them. Because I know what it's like to be in that shoes not, you know, only two, three years yeah. ago. Yeah, and so. then all of a sudden, it can just click. It's yeah. just like, you're like, oh, that makes sense. When it rains, it pours. Oh, yeah. Yeah, when, when, once, it, once, once you start to figure out how, you know, bigger, mature, mature deer move and how they act and where they are what time of year, it's, it's a game changer. It, it, people are like, well, how do you see so many deer? And it's like, you don't realize I spend, you know, you may spend one weekend in the woods. I spend 360, 365 days a year in the woods. You yeah. know, I, I spend a lot more time in the woods than, than most people. And, uh, you know, a lot of people joke at my wife all the time, you know, he's married to the woods. He's not married to you. And <laughs> it's true. But it, 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 it's, I but if you didn't have that time in the woods, you wouldn't be you. That's the way I always like if, if for some reason, hunting got taken away from me yeah you know in life or yeah. for something i wouldn't be nowhere near the same person, right i wouldn't be you know? i wouldn't be complete you know yeah you'd, you'd, you'd be missing a lot oh yeah <laughs> it, it's true yeah but you are the sum of your five best friends is what the old adage is and it works with hunting too if you're yeah. going to surround yourself with good hunters and that's what i've been blessed with on this podcast is meeting a lot of the same people like neil's also giving me a lot of good pointers yeah. and a ton tons of guys it's everybody who's been on the podcast it's yeah. like being across from them you know, some of the guys listening to this, you're going to get a lot out of it too. Of just sitting here, like I, I learned so much, and right. I really take in everything. Yeah, you have to. Yeah, you, you you know, you can't go in and into it narrow minded, or you know, if anybody ever tells you there's only one way to skin a cat, just stop listening to that person because there's a million ways to skin a cat. There's yeah. a million ways to kill big deer. Yeah, you know, there, there's there you know there are people that are one trick ponies and that you know they have their their knack. You know, like the bonites are tracking and yep. You know, there's there, but there's so many different ways to you know suburban versus big woods versus you know bow hunting versus rifle hunting that's why we're blessed up here because we have it all and you got so many states too so if you if you do get into it to the level that you are and you tag out in new hampshire you can slip over to massachusetts you can go to maine and go tracking or go to vermont or go do a late season muzzleloader hunt in new jersey or something like yeah there's all kinds of crazy luckily for where i live i can be i can be to mass and minutes i can be to maine in an hour i can be to vermont a little over an hour so you know 
during, during, during turkey season and deer season, it's great. I can I can just slip over a border and you know after work I can either hunt New Hampshire or Massachusetts. Yeah. I'm like, oh, where do I want to go? To where where do I have the most activity? <laughs> you know, I'm gonna go to New Hampshire. Today. Well, if I'm you ever get mask. the knack to kill immature deer again, you can just go to Vermont. And uh, you I've save been that. You're like, oh, I'm gonna go shoot a four pointer over there. Yeah, <laughs> I've, I've I've done that uh, that late season doe hunt in Vermont the last two years in Zone K and that. That, that's pretty cool. There's a lot of deer over there. Um, that's, that's my zone over there where okay. my deer camp is. Yeah. Yeah. Um, but a lot of lot of posted property. That's the biggest thing. There's, you know, permission is the biggest thing over there. But I, I've killed a few deer over there the last couple of years. But it's it's fun. It's it's it, it's it's different terrain, you know. Yeah. In southern New Hampshire is a lot of flatland and, you know, suburban hunting. And then you get out into Vermont, it's, you know, steep foothills and it's big open hardwoods. And it's like, we're, we don't have anywhere in New Hampshire that looks like this. Yeah. And I, I like Vermont. Vermont's probably my – if. Vermont had good deer, yeah, and you I know, agree. and a subs- like a good work, you know, something I could do for work. Would, I would live in Vermont, yep. like that, yep. no questions asked. So that would be does would be where I reside. But they, you know, they're like you said, their deer, their deer herd sucks. <laughs> <laughs> Nothing against the Vermont hunters. Um, it does, the, you know, and there's not a lot of work in vermont it's like anywhere you can find good deer there and if you get into the green mountains it's giant woods and giant patches there's good deer in the green mountains you're gonna have to work for it right um and then if you have farm you know farm or permission on a farm you can get some good stuff yeah you get up towards towards new york and you know that that west southwestern corner of vermont there's there's some some really good you know terrain and ag over there that grows that could grow some good deer but there's uh there's there's good turkey hunting in vermont i hate i hate vermont for turkey hunting. <laughs> do you i hate it i <laughs> i i turkey hunt maine new hampshire mass new york vermont this year and vermont is like my kryptonite i i i struggle can't figure it out i just struggle i it's you know i either either i miss or i just i mess it up i i just have the hardest time in vermont i i did this year was the first year i tagged out on two long beards in vermont i've killed a long beard and a jake but this year was the first year i killed two long beards over there and it was i was yes, i wasn't was, a complete I was, failure i was like yeah about time <laughs> uh but i i like it vermont's probably my favorite state to turkey hunt because of the struggle you know i i go to you know I go to Maine. It's you know you can be done in Maine in an hour. There's a there's a ton of turkeys up makes there. Makes you better. Exactly, it does. It makes you yep. better. When I went down to North Carolina this year, it made me you know walking two miles in Vermont across a you know a ridge to go find a turkey is nothing in Vermont. You yeah. You know by noontime I can do twelve miles, ten twelve miles. And when I went to North Carolina, I was covering that you know in no time down there and i was yeah. like man if i didn't go to vermont i would never know how to hunt turkeys yeah. like this and yeah i was into turkeys you yeah. know it took me a day to get into them but once i was into them i was i was into them and i was like man thank god for vermont that's why, that's why those woodchucks are such good deer hunters yeah too. right <laughs> you can put a vermonter anywhere in this country and they'll, yeah. they'll kill yeah. yeah there's some really damn good hunters that come from vermont yeah, and it's, it was just to uh, open my eyes when I saw what a different deer herd can look like, you know, when I started, Only one state started away. hunting. Yeah, yeah, literally just north. Yeah, and it was the reverse where I, I moved to Boston, and I was like, man, I'm never going to hunt. If I'm in Boston, I'm only – I got to drive four hours to get back to Vermont. And yeah. I was thinking, like, I was – I was narrow-minded, just thinking Vermont's the only place to hunt. Right. Little did I know it's these suburbs have 150 inch deer. Yeah. Uh, almost yeah. everywhere, you know. Yep. Not everywhere, but and even Western Mass, yeah. even the herd out there is better than the Vermont herd. And oh it's yeah. The same mountain structure, but it's just it goes right up through the state, yeah. you know. But it's it's crazy. It's just I think it's just better management, and you know, and it's crazy because Massachusetts doesn't even have an antler restriction like Vermont does, and no. and. There's w- the quality deer is you shoot whatever you want. Better. It's just yeah, I think there's less hunters. It's more anti. So the, the culture isn't there. Where right, where Vermont is very pro hunting. Yeah, and know? everybody's hunting. Right, there's not a you know if you see a Toyota Tacoma on the side of the road, it's a hunter. <laughs> Even if you see a Subaru. <laughs> Subaru, it's a, it's a hunter in Vermont. <laughs> yep, yep. Um, it's true. All right, we got some questions from people that they submitted, and also we're trying something. I told people to call in at nine thirty. Yeah. We'll, we'll do some live calls Perfect. and just see how that goes. Yeah. Um, but on the turkey note, Ethan Pike. How can you kill big bucks and still say that turkey hunting is better? Oh, I love turkey hunting. <laughs> Ethan, uh, Ethan's a he's a killer. He's yeah. he he's not, he did really good this year. Um, I love seeing this, but he takes some really cool pictures. He he does very well with that. I'll have to check it out. Yeah, he's he's I I don't know something about turkeys. 
I just absolutely love because they're responsive. You know, it's you get to interact with them. Deer, yeah, you can get a call responsive buck that's going to, you know, he's going to posture, react different to when you call to him. But he's not going to, you know, very not very often when you get a buck that you grunt to him and he grunts back. With a turkey, you call to him, you, you can hear that thing coming from four, five, six hundred yards early season when the foliage is, you know, isn't there. And it, it it's cool that you can, you know, the whole time you know where he's coming from. You, you know he's there. It's not like when you're sitting in a deer stand and you're like, I hope that buck gets out of his bed and, you know, he comes this way tonight. When when you're turkey hunting, you're you're in the game almost yep. the whole time, yeah. you know. I, I li- so it's a little more of a constant focus, and that's the reason. Yeah, like it's like constant constant action. action. Yeah, yeah, that's I think that's what that's what drives my love for turkey hunting, is that there's you know there's that constant interaction with the birds. But when you shoot one, is it the same feeling no. as when you shoot a mature no. buck? <laughs> no, so, so not the, even close. Yeah, the end result is is Completely better different. for deer hunting. Correct. But you pref- you 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 would if you had to choose if if deer gobbled <laughs> and they came in with racks like that, I I'd just hunt deer the rest of my life. But it's it's the it's the cat and mouse game before the hunt with turkeys and with deer. It's when it all comes together. Yeah, that's that's the best way. All right, that's a good way to put it. Yeah. Kel, Kel Young says, and I'm wondering what he means by this, but what's with the mullet? Does he mean what's with you? This is mullet 2.0. Cutting it down or what? You know what's with the mullet? So. I, I I always joked about having a mullet for the longest time and I was like <laughs> finally I went to the barber one day and I was like my for the longest for like I don't know probably probably that year I started passing on deer I was like I'm not cutting my hair until I shoot a good buck and I shot a good Did buck Did you say to the barber if you could put any hair on me, what would it be? And he shaved, he cut the mullet <laughs> no. into you? Well, he, he kind of like, the time before I got my hair cut, he was like, dude, your hair's long enough to cut into a mullet. And I was like, yeah, I was like, I don't know, I feel mullet. Like, I always joked about it. And then I went in there after I killed that, you know, that 110-inch eight point I was talking about. And uh, he's like, your hair is definitely long enough to grow, to, you know, cut into a mullet. I was like, go ahead, dude, do it. And, uh, and he did it. And then everybody's like, Dude, that's awesome. That's like the all American haircut. That Dude, fits you. It does fit you. So I was like, all right, let's keep it. So I I I grew it for two years and it was down in between my shoulder blades and uh Super Bowl Sunday this past year, my buddies were like, We'll give you five hundred bucks to cut it. And I was like you want to give me 500 bucks to cut my hair of gold? Done, dude. Yeah, I was like, it's I'll hair. I'll see you again go, in two years. Yeah, exactly. We'll go back. <laughs> so they, they all, they, I was like, put the cash in my hand and you guys can do whatever you want. So they put the 500 bucks in my hand and off it went. And I was like, <laughs> all right, time to grow another one. So I, I was, for the longest time, I was like, do I grow another one? And I was like, yeah, I miss having long hair. It was awesome. I was like, <laughs> yeah, we're growing it back. So we're on mullet 2.0 right Sweet. now. Yeah. Um, while we're talking about, about that, Let's let's set the record straight on the fucking hunt stock tickets that I put in the oh, woods and I'm that so whole mad. thing. I'm so mad your camera died. Oh it my wasn't God. working. It just wasn't working, or somebody took all the pictures because there were no videos on it. There was so, nothing. No. So that, somebody either deleted them or the thing just wasn't working. But for those who didn't see, I, I hit a bunch of hunt stock uh, uh, three day passes in the woods in a plastic bag, and I did some scouting and made sure I was going to be in like a big buck zone. I found it was on an annual scrape and. Uh, there's a signpost rub there too. It was just like a nice looking spot, and I narrowed in the maps over the times. And, and I don't know how many people actually went to look. I think three or four did. Yeah. Um, because a few people messaged me. We but found then your camera. <laughs> finally, finally, the last day, uh, it was like a week or ten days had gone by or something. And I was like, all right, I'm just gonna drop uh, literally the pin. Yeah. So I dropped the pin and where it was, and I knew somebody was gonna go get it for weeks. Nobody reached out, and they were like, I, "It was I figured, a month. It was at least a month." Yeah, or a month. Yeah. I was like, "Man, who got those tickets?" Because no, <laughs> nobody, nobody sent me a picture of it or a picture of the antler that was there that I dropped. And then finally, you did. You're yeah, like, I'm like, just... "Did you check that camera yet?" <laughs> so when when you when you narrowed it in, you put the deer icon right there. I was like, "All right, I'm just going right to that icon." Yeah. You know, the emoji that you put there. And I got there, and there's that hill that's right there, and it was dark. It was a rainy day the day that you posted it and everything was you know dark brown or black so i'm i'm looking around and i can just see the shine and i was like <laughs> what is that and it was right you know down towards the house and i was like that's something so i walked down and i'm like that's a plastic bag so i just walked right over there <laughs> and i'm like where's the ca-? and i didn't expect the camera to be that high up i was expecting it to be lower so like i got right to there was a big pine tree right there i was like oh camera's right there so i backed up and i looped around the camera <laughs> and i was like how can i make this funny so i'm sitting there and i'm kind of like I'm debating it and I'm like 
all right. So I stripped down and I was like, do I go completely naked and grab this? And it, it crossed my mind. I was like, I don't know, Pat, is he could put me on a list if he really wanted to. I was like, I'll go in my underwear and my Chippewas. So I, I stripped down to my underwear and my Chippewas. I walk over there, I throw it back and I pick the pa- the antler up and I grab the passes. And I was like, oh, this is going to be awesome. He's going to check this camera. I'm not going to say anything. I'm not going to say a word until he checks this camera. Yeah, because that <coughs> the shock value would have been the best part. Oh, yeah. No doubt. So, um, so I, I I let it be, and I was like, man, I'm like, it's been like a month. There's no way he hasn't checked that camera. Yeah. And then uh, I I I was like, finally, I was like, man, maybe the camera wasn't working or was dead or something like that. So that's when I messaged you. I sent, I think I just sent you a picture of the antler, right? Yeah. And I was like, you didn't check that camera, bro. And you were like, oh, I'll go check it this week. I was, and then when you were like, it's not there. I was like, man, man, I, I got naked for nothing. <laughs> I was, I was fucking bummed because I was gonna do an like an awesome recap video. Yeah. But that, I mean, that would have been hilarious. Oh too, yeah, but <laughs> see, see my fat ass walking out there grabbing a deer oh antler, just my, my teal underwear. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, dude, congrats on uh, on those tickets yeah, too. You. Yeah, that's awesome. Um, all right, we'll go down the list here. Joe DeMaio. Oh, Joe. What's with the coonskin hat? Dude, the coonskin cap. That was that was the staple of North Carolina. H- Henry and Brett, they were they were like, you need to kill a turkey in a coonskin cap and just, you don't have a mullet anymore. You need a coonskin cap. <laughs> was this your first time going to North Carolina? Yeah, it was my yeah. first year going down there. It was, you know, Brett and those guys, they planned it and they invited yep. me down. And Henry's like, you got you to gotta get a coonskin cap. You don't have a mullet anymore. Get the coonskin cap. So I, I ordered one on Amazon, <laughs> and I wish I I wish I could have you know brought one of the ones I trapped and had it turned into a hat. But there was just no way in the time that the joke started to when it actually happened that could have happened. But so I ordered one, and um, I I wore it turkey hunting, and I was like, this is gonna be awesome. I was like, just coonskin cap, turkey over the shoulder. That thing is jinxed. Every time I wear that oh, thing. No. Nothing but bad came of it. Yeah. Like three or four mornings in a row, I wore that thing, and I was like, I'd roost these turkeys on the edge of a field. I'd have a decoy out there, like prime set up for, you know, turkeys. Turkeys would fly the other way into the woods, and I was like, I'm not wearing this hat. Stopped wearing it. Next day, I killed a bird. I was like, yep, <laughs> this thing's not going yeah, on. Yeah, so you're going to have to do one of the ones that you Yeah, that trapped. I trapped, yeah. So was, let's talk about that quickly, dude. You yeah. got into trapping. Is it is it new, or have you been doing it for a few years? So when I was like 14 or 15, I trapped for one year. Mm-hmm. Um there was a kid that grew up, you know, a couple miles down the road. His family was big into trapping. And we, you know, I just ran a couple traps on, you know, small ponds and stuff like that. I didn't get into it as hardcore as, but I didn't have a license then either. I was, you know, a driver's license. I had a trapping license, but not a driver's license. And um, I couldn't really get around anywhere. It was just, you know, close to home, ride the bike. You know, I can't tell you how many muskrat I had draped over the handlebars of my Haro yeah. bike riding home <clears throat> as a kid. And uh, this year, I, it was funny. There was a guy up in New Boston, New Hampshire. I, you know, I had some stretchers and stuff like that that I got rid of and gave to people because I hadn't trapped in you know twelve years. Yep. And uh, there was a guy up there. He skins and fleshes stuff and charges short money for it. And I went up there and I dropped off some coyotes I shot during deer season that I had frozen. And I was like, man, I really miss this. And I was just kind of sitting there <laughs> looking around. I'm like, all the furs. Yeah, yeah. All, all the fur that was hanging. I'm like, I'm getting back into it. And you know, it just. <laughs> switch went on and i you know I, I always would do like odds and ends like for like my aunt would call me hey there's a squirrel in the attic can you come get it yeah no problem i'd go up yeah. there and i'd put a little cage trap from you know yeah my, yeah and i would never charge anybody or anything like that i would just do it just to help them out but i always like that you know trap like, oh, yes a little bit of it, you go, yeah, yeah exactly i got him it was it was the it was the i won part yeah you know that yeah. that gets that gets me about trapping and on you know so i i, I got back into it this year and i think Anybody that's going to become a deer hunter should be a trapper first. It it is the most, you know, when you're trapping fur bears like uh, coyotes and you know all those predators, coyotes, fox, coon, you, you know, you have a two inch by two inch pan that you're trying to get them to step on. You have to, you know, you have to not only trick their nose, trick their yep. eyes. You have to get them to step on that, you know, two inch by two inch pan. And the thing is, is you know, uh, similar to deer hunting, is you can't 
you can't go set up in the middle of the woods on no sign and shoot deer. I mean, you can, don't get me wrong, but to be consistent, consistently successful, you need to stay on top of active sign and same goes with trapping. You know, you can't put a trap in a brook that's, you know, 45 feet wide and expect to catch a beaver and, you know, on the side of the brook, it's just not going to happen. You have to find that run where they're going underneath a log yep. and, you know, that's where you're going to put you your trap. You probably learn a lot about funnels, don't you? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that's It's huge, you know, whether it be for fisher or otter or beaver, you know, you learn a lot about pinch points and funnels, whether it be water or land. You know, those land bridges that, you know, go in between swamps and fields, bar gaps and stuff like that, those are great for catching predators, any points and stuff like that. Um, it's just, it Trapping is just, like, really, really good for your basic fundamentals of woodman, woodsmanship. You know, you, you'll learn a lot about being in the right place and setting up on the right stuff, and it, it applies right into deer hunting. And I, and I wish I took trapping more serious when I was younger because – it, you know, it kind of like when I got back into it this year, it was like, man, this applies so much to deer hunting and I don't even realize it. <laughs> yeah. You know, and it, it seems like you crushed it this year. Like, yeah. I, what did you get for the different animals oh in your totals? I, if I you killed, know. I killed over like 120 beavers. This was from January to the first week of April. I killed like 120 beavers. <laughs> I got nine otter, um, like 20 muskrats, somewhere around there, 15, 20 muskrats, Jeez. um, half a dozen coyotes, um, that was pretty much it. I mostly water trapped. I got a couple mink. That's, got, that sounds incredible to me. I mean, yeah. I don't know how good that is. It, it, it's probably really it, good. There's, put it this way. The, there's not a lot of beavers left in southern New Hampshire. And, <laughs> and, and pretty much any any beaver pond that's within five miles of my house doesn't have beavers in it anymore. No, did you eat any of it? <clears throat> I, I didn't personally, but I had a lot of people that wanted to try it. And, you know, uh, I had a lot of people take them for bear bait and coyote baits. They're frozen, you know, in there. You know, they're either frozen for bear season or people put them out in their backyards for coyotes or you know, at their bait piles. But I had a couple of buddies that came and they, you know, they, they took whole beavers and they cooked them and they said it was absolutely incredible. Yeah. And I mean, I would definitely try it. I, I want to try it. I just, all I'm, that meat. Some of them can be big too. 40 oh pounds, 50, 60, 50, 70 pounds. I got Holy one. I got shit. one. that was like 60 something pounds this year. Oh it was my like 69 God. pounds. It was huge. It was, I, I put a picture of it on my Instagram story <laughs> yeah. the other day. There was like a 40 pound. I've killed a deer that's 60 pounds. Yeah, exactly. There was, you know, it was like a 40 pound beaver next to it. And this thing just dwarfs it. And it, it was Jeez. just, it, it was legit like this big. I had a pack basket on and I, I had a beaver in each hand and I took that beaver and I put him over my shoulders on my pack basket and he like draped over the sides of it. And I had like a quarter mile walk out and I probably had like 130 pounds of beavers. I was like, this is terrible. I was wow. like, this is a bad idea. But it was, you know, it was, I was trying to reach a goal of like a hundred. and Crockett beaver. Yeah, right? exactly. I was trying to reach it like 110 beavers. Um, and that was like the last like two days of the season. Those were like my last ones. I was like, thank God it's over. <laughs> that's I, awesome, I started man. doing a lot of nuisance trapping too. So that's, um, I got coons and, and, well, coons and beavers, ton of beavers in southern New Hampshire that people, you know, they have retention ponds and stuff like that that get blocked up and people call me and I have a license that I can, you know, charge and and make money off of doing it. So it's a good little side. That's cool. It's a good side hustle. Yeah. You know, it pays, it pays for my hunting stuff. A That's lot really of times, cool. I'll just take that money and I'll just put it aside and... Okay, that's going to go towards my taxidermy bill. That's going to yeah. go towards, you know, going to North Carolina and stuff yep. like that for turkey season. I, and are you keeping all the furs too? So I sold a lot of the beavers. Beavers are a ton of work. When How much can you sell a fur for on a beaver? It's, it's sad now. They used to, you know, a put like a stretch beaver. They call that put up. A, you know, flesh stretch, skin flesh stretch beaver was like $60, $70. And used to be. Now they're like $15. It's pretty sad wow. how drastically the fur market has dropped. But, um... I had a guy that was buying them for casters and fur, so I would just take them up, and he would buy them whole from me, and um, it worked out really good. So I, I, I could, you know, stay trapping, and he could stay busy, yep. and I could make money. So it worked out, you know. And you're giving some of the uh, tails to Adam? Adam, yeah, yeah. Adam Adam made some cool leather stuff. He actually made me a wallet, and um, there was uh, some people that wanted furs and stuff like that, so that I brought, like, I don't know. I pro I probably brought like forty animals to the tannery down in New Jersey, so I'll get some of that stuff back. I I kept all, all my coyotes, my fox, and then um, I kept like half a dozen beavers and yeah, some. Yeah, because you want that, like that that room that yeah, got you back into it. You're like, oh, I want these hanging furs. Yeah, right? exactly. So I'll I'll have some hangers around the house with you know coyotes and fox and stuff like that. I'm, I actually told Dave that at Huntstock I'm gonna put some of the stuff up at his booth just for people to see. So oh yeah, it'd be cool. Yeah, awesome. Um. When you get a big, oh, this is from McClure Design Build. Oh, Sam. Sam, when you get a buck on a big buck on camera, what's your next move? Ooh, that's a, that's a loaded question because <laughs> because there's so much that goes into that. It, if if I get a midnight buck 
you know, cruising by a scrape and that's the only time I've had a, you know, a picture of them there. Yeah. I'm probably going to expand my search and start looking around more to try to, you know, find out where that deer's, you know, closer to his core area. But if, yeah, if midnight I, bucks, not going to mean you're going right in. No, no. Yeah. But if I have a deer that, you know, every cold front he's, he's coming in and checking or after a heavy rain, he's coming in and checking a scrape or, you know, after a drastic, you know, weather shift, he's coming in and checking a scrape and I got a picture of him, you know, after you know the night before on a you know after a heavy rain let's say and there's a cold front coming in tomorrow i'm probably gonna hunt that same yeah. you know i never go in so many the, the worst part about cell cameras is that people are chasing their tails a lot of times is people get a picture and they get so excited about getting a picture and of a buck long gone he's in a different part of a cycle exactly he's, yeah. he's he's you know it's gonna be three or four to five days even a week you know, two weeks before he revisits that scrape he's just yeah. coming in and he's just checking things out yeah but i it's a it's one of those things where it's it's very circumstantial because if it's rut and I get a picture of a buck chasing a doe, I'm gonna go in there as soon as possible because that doe's hot. You know she's probably bedded right in that wherever you know, the closest bedding area is to my camera. Yep. But if it's you know September or you know October and it's midnight and it's the first picture I've ever gotten of that buck, I'm I'm not gonna get super. I'll get excited that the deer's there if it's a good buck, but I'm not gonna go in there chasing right after him until the next uh, until I either you know hone in on a more the next substantial weather movement so that's that's pretty much how i how i play this the cell camera game yeah and regular cameras it's like you check it when you happen to be hunting in the area right yeah and, and, and at that point if, it's if, like if i if i if yeah if i had a buck that came through 10 minutes before <laughs> then i guess i can you know then if you I, start hitting the grunt tube yeah <laughs> well and that's the other thing is too if it's bow season i'm not you know, I'm not going to be one to really ambush deer with a bow. Have I shot deer on the ground with my bow? Yes, but I'm not going to... With a gun, I'll get... If I, you know, if say I walk up to a regular camera and there's a picture of a deer on it 10 minutes before, I'm going to I'm gonna try to, you know, hunt that deer down because I can, you know, t- take a lot more shot up. You know, I can take a lot more shots with a gun than I can a bow. So... Let's um let's talk about that New Hampshire buck that you got last year. How much did that thing weigh? Two twenty. Two twenty. Yeah, that that was, thing was a beast. Was I a love beast. that picture. You know, it, it, yeah, it's it's that was, that was my lucky. That's my lucky deer. Was it, it was still hunting or tracking yeah, or was, what? No, it was still hunting. It was so it was opening day in New Hampshire. Um, it was I didn't really have much going on. The acorn. I'm sure you saw it down here. There was not a lot of acorns last year anywhere. Yeah. It was very hard to find like consistent deer feed or just anywhere that deer were feeding last year. There was a lot of browsing. So was your spot where you killed these? It was kind dry. Of, it, was it was dry. It was dry. So you I, I had abandoned that, it. I had that eight pointer that I hit and never recovered. That was like really one of the only times I had bucks out there this year. And there was no acorn. There was no acorns anywhere. Um, so my buddy, <coughs> excuse me, my buddy Lucas Benoit. He, he's you know he's one of my best friends and he's like just come up here he's like you know what do you got to lose you got nothing going on yeah. down there come up here and have yeah. nothing to lose so i was like yeah you know what screw it and i was hunting in vermont the night before that because vermont that that um muzzleloader season i think around it it's either thursday friday or wednesday thursday friday it's thursday friday saturday, saturday sunday Sunday. So, okay so i got up there wednesday night hunted thursday friday and then friday night after i shot i shot a doe that friday night and then i jumped in the truck and i headed home and i got home at like midnight it was like 11 or midnight and then i got up at four to go hunt with lucas so i yeah. literally i was yeah. like i was like this driving up to you know his place i'm like this is brutal i didn't even <laughs> cut the deer up you know they were they were tagged and everything but they were they were in the bed of my truck and i was like hey i'm throwing these deer in your you know in your garage when we get up there so i can so they're not in the bed of the truck <laughs> excuse me and uh I had been up in there into you know this piece of woods before, and he's like, "I'm gonna go this way," and I'm like, "All right, well, I know what this route entails, so I'm just you know, I have, I have a good lay of the land, so I'm gonna pursue that way." And have you hunted there before? Never hunted it, no? but yeah. I I had been I've been in the woods before, yeah. and um, so I you know I walked this big oak bench for a mile mile and a half, and I came across it was wicked thick fog, it was downpour, it was you know I was like, "It's this is gonna suck no matter what," but it's opening day muzzleloader, you can't yeah. not go, yeah. you know. Yeah. So I, I was I was walking. It was terribly thick fog, and I saw a flock of turkeys, and I was like, "Cool! I saw, I saw wildlife. <laughs> yeah. like, this is cool." And then I, I, you know, I got off that oak bench and it got into like a more open area, and it was like a saddle in between a you know a main ridge and another ridge. I got in that saddle, and there was like I was finding a lot of smaller scrapes, and there was some fresher rubs. I'm like, "All right, there's some, definitely some deer in here." And I, I was coming up through. There was a bunch of old moose rubs, and I was coming up through this wicked softwood patch, and I 
peeked up over onto the, like this bench and there was two does standing there looking at me. I'm like, oh, they were like 40 yards and it's up there. You get like opening day of either sex, but I'm like, I'm not, you only get one buck tag. I'm not shooting a doe. So yeah. I, I watched them. It was cool. You already had a doe back. In the, <laughs> yeah. I, I had already, too. yeah, exactly. I didn't, I didn't need any more deer. So I, I watched them and they took off and Lucas said, there's a, he's like, there's a big scrape up on top of this hill. Go see if it's opened up. So I walked up there and I get to the scrape and I thought he said there was a camera up there. So I'm looking around forever. I'm like, what the hell is this camera? And I couldn't find a camera. And I texted him. I was like, where's this camera? He's like, there's no camera there. I just wanted you to check the scrape. I'm like, oh, okay. But he's like, there is a camera down here. Can you go get it for me? It's not, it's not working anymore. I said, yeah, no problem. So it was wicked, thick, softwood, you know, it was very neatly, you know, floor, you know, yeah. the, the woods floor was, so it, rain, Quiet. rain and all needles, you can imagine how quiet that yeah, was. You I know? love walking through that it, stuff. Yeah, so I was, I, I was like, I, my visibility was only like 25, 30 yards. I couldn't see because it was so thick and it was heavy rain, you know. So I was just sneaking through like all these spruces and, I, you know, I'd, I'd, I'd go take a few steps, stop, take a few steps, stop. And it, it was, I just, I was, I think I just like, bobbed or weaved and i looked up and i just see the ass of a deer standing up and it was he was he was getting up yeah he 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 got up ass first and then he was you know and then i watched him push his shoulders right up off the ground he he didn't know you were there oh he he had no idea i was there and the the, Uh. it was it was downpouring so i think i think he smelt me i don't think he heard me because if he heard me it would have been gone if he saw me it would have been gone so i think he got up because he smelt me because he he got up and at that point, the gun was already, you know, semi-shouldered. And I thought it was a moose at first because it was so big. And then I was like, nope, that's brown. You know, that's deer color. So then I snapped the gun up and I'm looking like I – not through my scope, but I got my eye right next to my scope. And I look and I shot a doe the night before in Vermont, never took my scope off nine power. I was like, <laughs> oh, no. So I'm, I'm like trying to, you know, all heat of the moment. And I still didn't know what it was for a deer. And it was a big deer, but I didn't know how big it was. And then all of a sudden – his head, I'll never forget his head snapped over like this and I was like oh you're dead and uh <laughs> and he he stood there for one second too long and I just put I I could it was funny so my scope I don't know, even know if I got it off a of nine power but I could see light in the bottom and light in the top and brown in between so I was like you put it in the middle I put it in the middle and I touched off and I actually shot him like right here in the throat he was facing right at me and uh <laughs> I thought I was shooting him more like here but I ended up shooting him right in the throat and um coming out right behind the shoulder on the opposing side you drop right there no so when i shot you know it, it's pouring rain i go over there and i can't find any blood it's downpour but when i shot his right front leg was you know he was he was three-legging it and i was like i'm pretty sure i just smoldered that thing and i uh i call lucas and i'm like i just got a bullet a real good one i'm pretty sure and he's like did you find it i was like i don't know i was like i'm gonna go look and i could fi- i could see in his bound marks that he was he was only running on three legs and i was like all right this he's he's hit but i went to the bed and there was it was funny there was hair you know hair where i hit him and there was a balloon like from me to you there was a pink <laughs> balloon from me to you in the bed i was like yep well that theory's true or semi true you know and uh i followed his bound marks and I was like just getting to that point where I was like, all right, I still haven't found blood, and I like, it's like, all right, I'm just gonna go like two more steps, and I just started to get a slight pit in my stomach, and I look up, and he's he's facing back at me dead, and I was like, no way, and oh man, I was like, wow, and I could see his rack because he's I, the biggest buck you've ever killed, weight wise, yeah, yeah, yeah and pro- uh, no, I I've killed a better racked deer, the second buck I killed this year in mass, um, but I walked up to him and I was like, wow, I couldn't believe the size of him, I called my buddy that I was hunting <laughs> with, and I was like. Man, I was like, I'm pretty sure I just killed my first 200 pounder. He's like that big. Huh? I'm like, oh, he's he's big. And as soon as I tied a rope around his antlers to tug him out, I'm like, oh, this thing's huge. I've never, I've never even, I don't think I've ever even seen a deer that big, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I, I was like, what's my best way out of here? And he explained to me, and I started tugging on him, and I got him, I don't know, a quarter half mile out, and I was never so happy to see him in my life. I was like, here's the rope, yeah. <laughs> and he pulled he pulled a good quarter mile or so, and then we got him down to the truck, and it was like. We we rode around town with a smile from ear to ear, both of us. Yeah, oh yeah, I, we paraded him around for a good hour or oh, so yeah. before, and it, you know everybody Had a couple brewskis, I'm sure. Everybody was giving us the thumbs up, and uh, he was actually having a Halloween party that night, so everybody came over. Awesome, and, dude. and there, you know there was 30, 40 people <laughs> yeah. there, and there's a 220 pound buck hanging in the garage. And yeah, I felt it, you know it felt really good, and that was it was just one of those things. It was right place, right time, and you know somebody else, you know. I've, I'm sure I've been that guy that probably walked within 100 yards of that deer and never saw him. But yeah. being in that you know, never being in that woods probably worked to my advantage because if I knew how thick that, you know, the, those spruces were, I probably would have either tried to go around them or tried, I would have known probably huh. the easiest way through. Yeah. And 
you know, being oblivious to the area, it probably bene- it did benefit. That's me, what you know? uh, Isaac Young and his buddy Nate there were telling said on on the podcast is they they hunt the spot the best time the first time they they hunt it. Yeah, you know, because you yeah. don't have any preconceived notions and you just it's pure. Right. You know? Yeah. You you don't know what what to expect or what you're going to run into, and I think that was that was probably the 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 best part of <laughs> of that hunt, and then. Plus shooting them in that thick, dark, sprucey stuff. And I've downpour. never done that, but I've always dreamed of like shooting one in that kind of. Oh thing. yeah. Because as I grew up, I'm like, well, that's where the big bucks live. Oh they yeah. All bed in there. Yeah. But I've really never seen it because I've only been hunting that kind of that kind of woods in Vermont. I never saw one in that. Yeah, in that Maine, kind of stuff, Northern but, New Hampshire, and Vermont are really yeah. the only place you're gonna you're gonna see some of that. But um, now, did Lucas? I know he's a really good hunter. Yeah, he's, he's probably scouted that around there. Did he have that uh, buck on camera? Yeah, he had, yeah. he probably had like a dozen pictures of that deer, and he, you know, I got them all. He sent them all to me, so that's cool. I kind of got the, I got him in velvet growing, and yeah. then when he was, you know, I got pictures of him on my wall. <laughs> well, and and that's wall, cool yeah, for him but, too. That yeah, he oh, he was his, just a tap. His, his buddy ends it. Yeah, know? exactly. He was, <laughs> and he had pictures of that deer from like two or three years prior, and he was, he, you know, he. I'm the same way. I, you know, if, if he came with me and he shot that deer, I would have been just as happy. Yeah. It, you know, I, I want to see him, you know, yeah. I, I don't care who gets him. I yeah. just want to see him. I, you know, I, it, I'm very happy when I shoot big deer, but seeing my buddy shoot him is just as awesome. Yeah, it really and, is. and he, and he was just as excited as I was, you know, he, he, he doesn't smile much and he had a big smile from ear to ear and, <laughs> and then he ended up shooting a 150 inch eight pointer. That was two Oh Oh yeah. I remember he got a slammer two Oh eight or two Oh nine is a beautiful two Oh six beautiful deer. It was, it was gorgeous. And he deserved, I mean, that kid, he's, He's one of the better woodsmen that the Northeast has to offer. He's, you know, he's quiet about it, but he's 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 a very very good. He's got great woodsmanship. It doesn't yep. matter whether it's from killing squirrels or killing black bears. He he knows how to do it. You know, he's kill some big ones. Yeah, he does. And over the is life, it big woods? Yeah. Oh yeah. He, yeah. Yeah. It's real big woods. And he and you know even himself over the last probably five or six years he's transitioned from you know he I mean he he shot some pretty really decent bucks but he went from shooting decent bucks to very big bucks yeah you know? just slammers yeah yeah, yeah. so the last i think the last four years he's he shot probably four deer over 125 inches yep he's, he's done well lucas well. i know you're quiet but if you want to come on to a podcast <laughs> good, let's luck. Do it. good luck <laughs> <laughs> or just come to huntstock and yeah. be in disguise yeah right <laughs> you got a, you got a better chance of seeing jesus <laughs> Oh, now do you still hunt much or is that just um, kind of the circumstance then? So I've, when I grew up hunting, I grew up like doing deer drives and stuff like that with like my neighbors and stuff like that. So I was, that was kind of like what got my foot in the door with hunting. And I, you know, I was like, man, this stomping around the woods, making a lot of noise doesn't make much sense. And <laughs> over the last probably six, yeah, yeah, five, six years, I, I started to slow down more and I started to, you know, kind of do my own thing and branch off and get away I, I haven't really done drives in a long time um but done a lot of still hunting like with buddies and stuff like that where okay hey i'm gonna go to that end of the piece i'm gonna go to this end and we'll meet up somewhere in the middle but over the last two or three years i've really like slowed down and become more successful still hunting um reading you know, the woods because you've because re- everything has come together now so the woods start to like fall into place yeah you can kind of you get you know so one, using trained your advantage is, is, yeah. is huge when it comes yeah. to still hunting i mean obviously going slow and being able to see deer and stuff like that is is very important too but i can't tell you how many times whether there's snow or bare ground i you know i've been walking and i'm just gonna peek up over that hill and or you know peek down into that bottom or the edge of that swamp and you look over and there's a deer laying on the edge of the swamp or there's a deer laying on a hillside and it's like if you know Five years ago, I would have just kept walking the side of that ridge, and that deer would have blown out the other way. And yeah. So many times now, it's it, it like you said, it makes more sense, and you start to hone in on and understand where deer are and why they're there. You know, late season, yeah, there's not going to be deer laying in the wide open hardwoods on the top of a ridge. Right. You, you might get some does bedding up there, but yeah. You know, a lot of times they're in the thick of the nastiest. Like yep. you posted on your Instagram story today, I used to avoid the stuff, but now I go into yeah. it. Yeah. And you know, the later the season, just little things will start to click, and then yeah. all of a sudden everything opens up. Yeah, most definitely. And you, 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 every time you step in the woods and you have an encounter with a deer, you better yourself as a still you know when you're still hunting you better yourself as a still hunter um or as a hunter and as a whole you know yeah one of one of the listeners of the podcast told me um that just one small piece that he he learned from the podcast that it just made him so much better was 
he 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 always had his cameras. He would start his cameras in the summertime, but they would be up in hardwoods mm-hmm. and <clears throat> you know, like on a ridge or something. And he was never getting any pictures. And I was just, he was messaging me about that. And I was like, why do you have your camera up there? You know, they don't have any reason really to be up there. They might pass through, but in the summer they're going to be living in the grassy, the browse. flowery browse yeah. forage. You know, like they're going to be in that kind of area. Right. You know, get into that thick stuff that I had on the Insta- on Instagram today, like that really thick leafy stuff. Right. If you can find it, put your cameras in there because they'll be there in the summer. Yeah, bit, he was bittersweet. Like, that briars. was one. Yeah. Bittersweet and briars. That's a place <laughs> yeah. to be in the summer. Yeah. it's it, that, And early season because yeah. before they transition out of there. Right. And they go into the swamps and, you know, the higher stem count stuff. Because once, once those leaves fall, like that's southern New Hampshire. It's so much of September. I'm hunting places where I'm 130 yards from that house because we only have a 300 feet, you know, law, a discharge law. So, you, with you know, if you're outside of 100 yards, you're legal. Yep. So the, I can't tell you how many pieces I hunt that are just tiny woods and September they're awesome because the deer you know yeah. the deer are living in there but then as soon as all the leaves change color and they fall you won't see a deer in there the rest of the season yep all and, their covers gone yeah, yeah. And, the, and the deer are gone too and the, the and that's that's a huge thing too a lot of people don't you know people go hunt these huge you know oak ridges or oak benches or oak stands whatever in September and don't get me wrong deer are gonna start crushing some acorns in September but the, you know those bigger woods Come gun season, get a lot of pressure. So I guess the better time to get in there is during bow season. But I I can't tell you how many deer I kill in real suburbs. You yeah, know, yeah. Um, cold the sack king. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. Yeah, cold the cold the sack king in September. <laughs> I, I I can't tell you how many you know a lot of people and a lot of people are just a door knock away from giving you permission too. There's a lot of people that you go for it. Yeah, yeah. I still haven't asked anybody really in the in the suburbs for permission. Really, I've got my spots that are all accessible. We're going to have our first call here. Oh, boy. <laughs> but the uh, transitioning from um, last year I saw, it was September 15th yeah. when uh, the first, uh, all my big bucks that were growing up in that summer area, they got out of there September 15th and they were hit, hitting the acres. And that's when New Hampshire season opens, <laughs> yeah. September 15th. That's the yep. that's the time of year. To... Yeah, that's exactly when it was. All right, we got our first caller on the podcast. You're live with uh, Stephen Champa. Uh, state your name and where you're from. Yes, hi. Is this uh, is this Patrick Gaetti? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, this is Pat. Hey, what's going on? This is uh, this is Justin from down here in Odd West Virginia. Oh God, Whitaker. <laughs> Are you from the Whitakers, dude? I live down the road from. <laughs> I know right in there I'm pretty good, but I see on the Insta talk that y'all was, y'all was taking calls, and uh, I'm not quite sure what I'm calling into, but I, I, I gave you a ring. I'm a little early. I didn't. I missed the 930 <coughs> mark there, but uh, what y'all got going on there tonight? No, we're just uh, talking deer hunting. Do you have a question for uh, Steven? Steven who? The cul-de-sac king. Cold the what? <laughs> The, the cul-de-sac king. Did you say Champer? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Stephen Champa. Champa. What's your question? What? What's your question, buddy? Why does that name sound familiar, Champa? <laughs> he's it? he's hey, bad news. He, the big fella running around naked on trail camera photo. <laughs> <laughs> That's, That's funny that you say that because we just talked about that story. Yes, that was him. I love your work, Stephen. That's that's a big feller you got you got up there. <laughs> if only we had the proof of it. All right. Uh, do you got you got any questions for him, or we'll hang up and wait for the next call? Um, I think uh, what y'all uh, <laughs> isn't there an event up there? It suburbia. Ain't, ain't there some sort of hunt? Hunt standard, or, 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 or yes. And if you want to come and deliver a seminar, we'll do a seminar with all the Whitakers there. So just uh, hit me up, <laughs> send, send me an email, huntsuburbia gmail dot com. Thanks for calling in, dude. We'll uh, we'll talk to you later. Sounds good, feller. Bye bye. <laughs> Who was that? <laughs> that was Jason Alex. He was, oh. <laughs> I was like, what the fuck? I, I that just was started, a pretty damn good accent. <laughs> that was pretty good. I just started following him on Instagram not that long ago. He was and he's, he puts out some good stuff. I like his podcast. Yeah, his podcast is great with Brandon and Jeremy. That was yep. that was that was a great podcast. Yeah. I, I just I never really listened to podcasts too much, and over the past I don't know month or two, I've I really started listening to him. And Jason puts out some really good stuff. I, 
Yeah, I like it. He's got a he's got a good interview style. Yeah, he asks the right questions. Yep, he, he asks a lot of good questions that you know are are informative to a lot of people too. You know? Totally. Yeah, he, he does a really good job with it. Hopefully, people call that I don't have their name for because I don't like the I don't like <laughs> I don't like that not being a surprise. You know, I know, right? Um, Somebody's got to be itching. It, it, now, do you track at all? Have you done any tracking or are you so getting into it? I've I've never like up until this year I've never gone out tracking with a purpose. Um, I've gone out and followed deer around in southern New Hampshire and stuff like that when there's snow on the ground. I've shot, I've shot deer, you know, mostly does and small bucks, just following tracks around the woods. But um, this year, I went out to the Adirondacks and um, I was gonna go up to Maine, but Maine got no snow that Thanksgiving week. And I was, it was kind of like a, I was supposed to go to, oh, well, I was either supposed to go to Maine or go to PA. My father-in-law got COVID the week that we were gonna go to PA, so I was like, all right, there goes that. So I'm like, all right, I'll go to Maine and. My buddy Lucas, he was up there, and he's like, there's no snow up here. He's like, we burned a tank of gas yesterday, and none of us even cut a deer track on fresh snow. He's like, don't waste your time. So Brett and those guys, they were going to the Adirondacks, and they were like, you want to come with us? I was like, yeah, absolutely. See some you know territory I've never seen before. And Brett Joy? Yeah. Yeah, those, cool. Those are <laughs> – that woods out there is – it, it's tough. It's harder than me. It's Maine. ancient, dude. It's, it's ancient for one, and for two, yeah. there's no access. You know, you have one trailhead, and that – yeah, that might get you into this million acres of you yeah, know yeah. of woods, but you're there's no roads, there's no yep. four wheeler trails, there's nothing that you That's can why use. Lots to, of people canoe to get in deep. Yeah, there's a there's nowhere that you can effectively cover ground like you can in Maine. You can't drive you know tote roads. Yeah, you can drive through neighborhoods and stuff like that, and you might cut a deer track and you know some of the development that's out there but there's not even a lot of that you know yeah. you, you'll go miles before you hit a neighborhood and, and you know what was crazy when when we were out there is it started snowing when we when like the first afternoon that we were out there I walked I think I did like five miles in and five miles out in an afternoon and I didn't even cut a deer track and I was like well that's kind of disappointing and then the next day I went back into the same piece of woods and I was like there's got to be deer moving around here somewhere I got in there like 200 yards I cut a deer track and then I went like another 200 yards I cut another excuse me I cut another deer track and then I walked like that same four or five mile stretch I never cut another deer track hmm. came back tracked a, tracked a deer ended up being a doe and then I ended up running into another group of does on a hillside and then I ended up chasing like a small you know four six pointer around for a few hours and then he swam across the river like a half hour before dark but it was it was cool because like you said it's ancient woods out there there's no I don't know how those deer live there's no there's no mass out there it's like yeah, there's it's... beach and beach are hit or miss. They don't, they, you know, they don't drop beach nuts every year. And then there's a lot of deer were pawing at ferns. Yeah, and there's like hardly any understory too. Yeah, there's yeah. nothing. It's yeah. it's just it's like you said, ancient woods. There's there's some stuff that like very very seldom is there any cutting up. They're probably eating lots of mushrooms. Mushrooms, yeah, ferns. There was uh, any fern that you saw was dug up, and it was you know you it was eight inches of snow, and there they are pawing up ferns at a hillside, just all the <laughs> what a tough the, life, huh? All the leatherwood ferns, and they shoot some huge deer out there. They oh shoot, yeah, they shoot some two hundred pound deer out there, and they actually have pretty good racks too out there. Yeah, the problem is is the the hardest part I had with out there is they're all the same size foot. Every deer, you know. Every deer I saw had, you know, like a two inch by two, you know, it was, it was a small two by two and a half inch track and it was like, okay, what's what it, you know, that's good. It, Cause we, we had a question from Brent Whitlock and that's why I was getting into, uh, oh wait, here we go. Oh boy. Another caller. Oh, hello. You're live with Steven champ on Huntsbury podcast. Uh, who is this and what's your question? I am a giant fan of Steve Champa. <laughs> oh, I know who that is. Especially his uh, hairstyle. Um, so glad I finally got to talk to you. My name is Wilma, Wilma Fingerdew. And I'm Are you a, from West uh, Virginia? I am actually a coal miner's daughter. A lot of West Virginia callers today. Uh, well, formerly of Utah. Utah. <laughs> okay. my, my mom's my sister's uncle. So uh, <laughs> just wanted to acknowledge Steve Champa and his amazingly luscious locks and sex appeal is sex, sex, sex appeal, appeal is, yeah. Uh, yeah i mean if you showed a little bit more nipple it would be just <laughs> lights out you'd be the star of the just on club if you just took your shirt off one or two more times <laughs> yeah we were just talking about that he went hunting with brett now do you have any questions for him on uh on, on deer hunting tactics uh what would you like to learn oh, from young steve oh deer hunting tactics 
Yes. What is your favorite brand of soap? Ooh. Which do you prefer? Do you, do you believe that there are three types of deer hunting? It doesn't matter which one you kill your deer on. Mountain, mid-level, or suburban? <laughs> there's deer, deer hunting is deer hunting as a whole. I don't think there's three different types. Yeah. I, I, oh. God, I wish I was attracted to you physically because that's a perfect answer. It, it, it really is. It, there's, it, it, if you're a one trick pony, you're you're just a one trick pony. You're not. Yeah. A, you're 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 gonna struggle. Right. In other parts. So you, of, so, so you agree that a mountain that, that labeling something a mountain buck is just a label to get more views. I'm not gonna answer that question. These sound like loaded questions. Yeah, these are loaded. <laughs> these are loaded questions. No, I agree with you. I appreciate you. You're a good friend, buddy. Keep on killing. Thanks, buddy. Right back at you. Yeah, man. Take care, guys. See ya. See ya. Don't <laughs> know where he's going with that. Yeah. What were we saying before? Before that. Oh, Brent Whitlock uh, was sending um, questions for you about tracking, and he he's like, I see that he's been getting into tracking. But yeah. He was asking, how do you choose the right track? How do you know which one is the right? And then you were saying Adirondacks was was not exactly close. the same size. Yeah, so. it's very hard. But I mean, I've I I've I've never I've never gone up to like that. Allagash or you know northern northern Maine woods where I've been like oh my god there's a track that I can put my 35 whaling bullet in and it's bigger than my you know yeah, that yeah. whaling bullet but that I mean like I, I can only go from what other people say I'm not the person to ask you know this question but you know you talk to guys like Isaac and stuff like that you know the stagger of the deer and the size of the track that's that's everything but in the same breath right that 220 pound deer I killed this year his foot I would have never taken his track in the snow. Really? Never. Yeah. I would have never taken his track. I would have yep. thought it was a doe. His foot was like my two thumbs put together. It was tiny. Huh. And then, you know, I, I I killed that that second mass buck that I killed this year. He had a, you know, big hoof on him. I, I, would, I saw his track in the power line before I killed him, probably 20 minutes before I killed him. And I killed him, I guess you could say it was tracking. Like, there was snow on the ground. <clears> there was too? snow on the ground. Yeah, yeah, it was like an inch of snow. I went out first thing that morning. I shot a doe. And then um, I was like, all right, I'm going to get out of here. I, you know, I. I was I had deer going everywhere and I just I shot a doe. I was like I'm getting out of here. Walked, drove probably half mile down the road. Got on a set of power lines. Walked the power lines. Cut a big track, and um, I followed him right into this doe bedding area. I seen a doe and two fawns cross the road. When I got in there and I kept following his track up into like this briary overgrown field and I got right to the edge of that, you know probably 100 yards before I lost his track and I'm like I wonder if he's right in that field and I've jumped here in that field before and I got out you know it was right when I like the snow the sun was starting to come out snow was starting to melt and uh you know I, I was like his general direction's heading that way so I got out there and as soon as I got to the edge of that field he'd come down out of the field and his worst mistake was he stopped to look back to see what I was and that was the end of him yeah <laughs> that was his worst that was his worst mistake in life yeah but yeah yeah, I mean, it's I'm, funny, like you said, it was his track was really, really small, right? Yeah. And there's a couple of things that I've heard people say is the flat footedness too. Yeah, or like look, if, even if a heavy buck with a small track, you know, he'll just sink down lower. So yeah. looking at the depth of you know of of how much weight how he much puts, he he puts into his track. Yeah. yeah. But then there's also <clears> you hear that if they're you know some big bucks walking uphill, they're on their toes, toes. and you can barely you know it looks like a tiny track because right. they're walking uphill on their toes, right? And it just looks like a fawn. It makes sense too. Yeah. But yeah, I, I I think that there's I'm no expert on it, but I think there is somewhat of a misconception on that too. I think a lot of deer get overlooked because they don't have that three by three track or they don't have that that big foot. And that prime example of that deer I shot this year, you yep. know, he, if if anybody saw that track in the snow, they would have thought it was just a small buck. Yeah, it was, it was nothing spectacular. Yeah, but he was two two twenty. Yeah, know? so a lot of them probably do just get overlooked and passed up. Yeah, of that. and and a lot of people say that you know sometimes those smaller tracks deer bring you to deer. So don't don't if you're struggling don't don't pass on a small buck track. Take it; it'll take you to other deer. And I've I experienced that a ton in the Adirondacks this year. You know, I I followed tracks and I would I'd follow one track for a quarter half three quarters even a mile and then all of a sudden boom it was a barnyard you know yeah and i think especially in the adirondacks it's like that right because they've it's so ancient so old and so minimal and food source that it might be barren for miles and miles and miles and, and all no of a feed. sudden you get into a pocket of them right and it's like it's almost like a yard you know it's like you'd come into like almost a deer yard and it was, that was the first snow of the year they got but you go in there and it was just you know i saw set, i think it was six seven does five six seven does together on this hillside and it was like Wow, that's it's almost like they're already starting to yard up, you know. Yeah. But it it's uh, 
I, it's something I want to I want to do more often. I, I started hunting Maine more this year. I, I saw a lot of deer and I saw two really nice bucks in Maine this year. One while hunting, one while driving. One was at night. I saw him and he was just absolute behemoth. He was like a mile down the road from my camp, chasing a doe <laughs> around underneath an apple tree. And I think I saw him the next day. Did you got a camp in Maine? Yeah, oh, in sweet. western side of Maine. Yeah, uh, zone fifteen. And I was up there and I saw a ton of deer. And I the, the thing that going forward, which is nice, but it, you know it. it they switch from one deer to now if you draw a doe permit, you can shoot two deer in Maine. You can shoot a buck. And a doe. Yeah, I heard about that. Yep. So I had a doe tag last year, but I, would, I didn't shoot a doe. I was up there to shoot a buck, and I passed on a four-pointer in Maine because I shot that 220-pound buck like two days before. I'm like, I can't. And, I can't. and you had to cut up a bunch of deer too. <laughs> yeah, I was like, I got deer from Vermont, New Hampshire deer. I'm like, I can't go from shooting that you know, 220-pound deer. I've never killed a deer in Maine, I'm, and this is – this will be my like third year of seriously yeah. hunting it. Some tell me you will this year. Yeah, yeah. I, th- I think so this year too. I, I, I plan on probably hunting there more than I do New Hampshire. It, it's hard because New Hampshire's, you know, my New Hampshire buck gun tag is that's once that's filled, pressure's off, then I can go anywhere. And you know, somebody wants to go to New York, you want to go to West Virginia, you want to go to Indiana, you want to go to Maine. Yeah, I'm in. You know, you, yeah. you don't have to twist my arm, but my once I I really focus on that New Hampshire gun tag, and once that's once that's filled, then then I venture out, but yeah. I think I might do more of Maine this year than New Hampshire. I really, you know, I think it would have like a lot of, it would be very rewarding to me if I go to Maine and, you know, shoot a deer. I'm and then now. you, you dial in a little bit more and yeah. spots over there so that you're just, <laughs> you know, building your knowledge around where you're at. Yeah. So the right, right. I can hunt right at the camp door. Um, and I was, you know, I was up on the mountain near my camp this year and I was in deer every day. You know, it was, I covered some ground walking and, you know, there's 10, 12 mile days, but I was, there were some days I was just moving to scout and, you know, rainy days or, you know, really hard weather days or windy days, which are good for still hunting. But there were some days yeah. where it was hot and I would just scout. I would just, you know, run at a million miles an hour and scout. And then there was days where, you know, those cooler, you know, better, better uh, movement days where I would, I'd, you know, hunt the sign that, that I would find. And I, I bet you, I, I think I saw I hunted probably seven days in Maine. I saw three bucks and ten does probably. So it was it was that's good. Yeah, it was really good. It yeah. was, like I said, every day I saw a deer, so it, yep. was, it was good to be into them. And it it was hopefully this year I can connect all the dots and make it happen. I got a lot of good intel that you know I found of you know signposts and big community scrapes that I want to actually go up there and hang some cameras on. So yeah, I think I'm going to do. I was going to ask you, what are you doing now, like f- to prepare for deer season? I put my first cameras out today. Did you? <laughs> yeah, Sweet. so I have cameras that you know are still alive from last year, but I put, <clears throat> um, I brought, I put cameras out that I you know I usually take out of like you know high traffic human traffic areas, and um, I I took those out and I put them back out today, so it was cool. I had a hen turkey. I had a mouth call in my truck. I heard could hear a hen turkey squawk, and so I called her <laughs> and I called her five feet from me. She come walking by me as I was setting up the camera and. It was cool. You can't get away from those. No, turkeys. I love those. He, he even he pulled into the driveway today about a half hour after I did, and when I pulled in the driveway, uh, there was a hen. A hen like seemed like she was digging a, a hole in the dirt. And I'm, I'm not a turkey guy, so I was like, "What the hell is that?" I brought Stephen over. I'm like, "What is this?" He's like, "Oh, she was in a dust bowl." Dust bowl, yeah. yeah. And right in my front yard, she yeah. was just dusting herself. Yeah. So right now, I'm just yeah, I'm just trying to get intel. You know, I. I I'm just gonna put cameras pretty much everywhere that historically I've I've seen bucks or hunted bucks or had good bucks on camera and see what's out there for inventory. Do you put any uh, mineral or anything? I don't. I don't really hang a ton of cameras in mass. I do hang cameras in mass. Oh, but you but can't in New Hampshire. You can't put any. Okay. No baiting. You can bait, but you can. You have to have a permit for it. Yeah. Um, I don't. Yeah. I don't bait. Um, so you're. I'm I'm pretty much scrapes and just yeah. high traffic, you know, runs and you yeah. know pinch points. That's that's what I'm focusing on. And this time of year, I mean, gr- greenfields like we talked about earlier, greenfields and stuff with that they're browsing on in the summer. That's I mean, that's where you're gonna get a lot of your your deer activity, and you're gonna see a lot of, you know, you're gonna get a lot of pictures so. wherever it's really thick. Yeah. And then when the winter come, you know, when the leaves start falling, it's not. And because they they love that because they're never there. They can only be there during that right. summertime when it's super thick. Right. So it's kind of like this where they vacation. They summer there. Right. They feel safe, and no, no humans go in there because it's really really thick. Right. And then in two months they're going to be living in a water hole. Yep. They go somewhere <laughs> completely different. <laughs> Dry spot yeah. in a water hole. That's where they're going to be. Yeah. Right. Cool. Uh, well, the last question was from Brandon Ashford. He wanted to know if uh, you could show him some prime hunting spots. <laughs> <laughs> 
Brandon. I'm sure you have plenty of prime spots. <laughs> tell, tell, I'll, I'll take I'll take Brandon anywhere he wants. <laughs> That's a good question. Yeah. There's an inside joke behind that. But yeah, <laughs> yeah, of course. I, I'll I'll take you wherever, Brandon. Yeah, wherever you want to go. Seemed like there were lots of inside jokes on the callers and the oh, questions yeah, today. Man, there was there was some good ones. That was. But dude, that was uh that was awesome. I appreciate yeah, you well, coming thanks on. Thanks for having and, me. I had a lot of fun with it. Yeah. So we'll do it again. Yeah. We'll see good. you at Huntstock and yeah. you're gonna crush some deer this year and hope so. Main main deer and that'll be that'll, that'll make my season. Awesome, dude. Yeah. Well thanks a lot. Thanks, dude. buddy. Appreciate yeah, it. Thank great. you.